Hey everyone, how's it going? Welcome back to Let's Play Final Fantasy IX. Today we are going to be going through the Desert Palace from start to finish. So we have back-to-back -back dungeons. Uh, right after we got finished with Olver, we also have... Ooh, the Desert Palace. That's actually a really nice typeface, I think. And right off the bat, there's a candelabra over on the left that we are going to want to light. Uh, this one stands out, it's really obvious, placed next to this angelic statue, and as soon as you light it, we get this first offering of power and a bloodstone, and when we retrieve the offering, uh, we get that promised ring. Truth of the Devil, Illusion of the Goddess, and, oh, I love how their heads track you, Promise of the Evil God. Uh, those statues are a just nice little homage to the Warring Triad statues from Final Fantasy VI. And again, we're going to be lighting these braziers uh, aflame so that we can move, uh, the, or we can dispel the illusion over the doors so we can travel throughout the dungeon. I've heard folks call this uh, the worst dungeon in the game, and the reasons for that are twofold. Uh, one, it's a really kind of puzzle-oriented dungeon, but to that I would rebut that by saying the puzzles are mostly just brain-dead toddler stuff. It's really just like, observe that there is a, a candle or a candelabra or some kind of brazier, and then click it. That's the majority of it. Uh, here, like, the only thing you really have to keep in mind is which of the two braziers cast or dispel the door illusion so you can get over to the other side and then finish lighting them. Uh, so in this one, we need the three on either side plus the two braziers in the middle lit. And that will reveal another offering to us. Oh, I'll... And, uh, this one down here. So, the three in the middle, I should say. And there's the Bloodstone, the Offering of Power. We'll remove the Bloodstone. And receive an Anklet this time. And we're also gonna head back downstairs. This is all the candle, uh, the lamps. Okay, we'll get back to that. Uh, so, that also dispelled one more illusory door on the far right this time, so we can proceed. And then, there's one candle here. So the second reason that people tend to not like this dungeon is that you do just get this other party, this B-team, foisted on you. Uh, if you don't know it's coming, you just kind of get dropped into this awkward position with, like, under-leveled characters and frankly a kind of weird party composition given that you just went into a dungeon where you had to to really carefully pick a party composition based on on like a very specific limitation uh, so you're left with just these stragglers who don't really have a lot of synergy with one another and like even I knew that this was coming and I still regret not at least subbing Amarin into the group over maybe Iko or someone. Uh, but it's also not the hardest in the world. I will say that the boss can be a little bit tricky. Uh, we just got the Enkai Armlet. It's an armlet that we are going to specifically equip on Vivi because it will teach him water. Uh, and water-based magic is, an, is a weakness of the upcoming boss. Now we just have to hopefully get a couple of random encounters so Vivi can actually learn that because I am going to want to, uh, want to unequip that before the fight. So ideally he would learn this before the fight starts. Uh, so the gimmick of this dungeon revolves around the candles and the candelabras and lighting everything in order to uh, collect offerings. It's not strictly necessary to get all the offerings, but you do have to light most, if not all, of the candles that trigger them, so you might as well get them because they give you an item. Uh, each of them gives a different item, uh, plus they all depower the boss a little bit. Uh, so again, we unlock this new pathway, just kind of, it's 
it's mostly a really linear dungeon. Uh, and now we're just gonna backtrack uh, to the Warring Triad statues. Because I just want to see if that finally unlocked. Uh, and it's not the biggest deal if we are missing a candle for this one. It looks like we are. Uh, yeah, somewhere along the way we just missed one candle. That one is actually pretty un um, pretty unimportant. And we got that. Good, good, good. So we're in good shape for the boss, at least. What would have happened if we had all of the necessary candles uh, for the statue below, for the statues, is the goddess statue would have activated and it would have, uh, it would have created like this spectral staircase leading to an upper balcony uh, where there'd be yet another candle and by activating that we could get some fairy earrings, but that's not too terribly important. Uh, these enemies will switch heads in order to enhance themselves, like uh, the, dif the different heads do different things. Like the red one is physical attacks. Uh, I think blue is magic attacks. I don't remember what yellow is. Uh, and they do... There are a whole lot of annoying status ailments in this dungeon, especially a lot of silences, a lot of petrifies, uh, along with slows and stops, with, which is... Functionally, just another Petrify. Uh, so the offerings will grant the boss of this dungeon a bunch of different powers. Uh, like immunity to elemental attacks. There's one that increases his magic damage output. Uh, let's see, there's magic evasion and uh, physical evasion. There's one for his, uh, for his physical defense and his magic defense. Uh, so as long as we go and uh, go throughout the dungeon and take all the offerings away, he's not going to have access to all of those enhancements, and thus becomes a lot easier. Still gets to be a little bit tricky just because of the nature of how the fight plays out, but... Hey, there we go. I love their death animation. And we are going to need a couple of more random encounters if we want to learn water on Vivi. It would be really nice to have that, uh, just to increase our damage output for the boss that little extra bit. This has been a tremendously low encounter rate dungeon so far. Uh, this one is just based around the shadows cast on the gargoyles on the walls. Uh, there are two candles to light on this side of the room, and then on the left there are three. We'll get two offerings, the last, I think the last two that we need, uh, from doing these. And note that we're not equipping anything aside from the Enkai Armlet. Uh, that'll teach VB Water. Because again, if we go into the boss fight with any of the things that we got from the Bloodstones, from the offerings, uh, he'll just activate his, en his enhancements anyway. We only have the armlet on Vivi so he can learn something that'll be beneficial against the boss. Hopefully. Still are getting really, really poor uh, encounters. Now we'll collect this offering. We have all five candles in this whole room lit. That's to get this. In order to proceed, we need to extinguish a few of those. Actually, I think we need to extinguish one on this side as well. I think it's the middle one. I think we put this one out, and then we put the leftmost candle on the other side out, and then we can actually move forward. Yeah, we want both of these uh, shadows facing towards the left, uh, is the trick here. And we get that cool little spectral staircase, and that's the dungeon. That's uh, the whole dungeon, aside from the boss fight, which we have now coming up. And we have to take the armlet off of Vivi because holy shit, he accrued virtually no AP throughout this whole dungeon because we got one random encounter. So... Ooh, automatic countermeasures. Yeah, that's not Kuja at all. Uh, the boss or the guardian of this dungeon is actually named Valia Pira. 
and it's a huge magical obelisk. Actually, it looks like it has uh, ideas that, uh, like that thing around her mantle. Okay, so detecting active bloodstones. Let's see if we got all of them. Failed to disable elemental attacks. Magic power enhancement failed. Defense enhancement failed. Evasion enhancement failed. So uh, so far so good. Magic defense enhancement failed. Magic evasion enhancement failed. All good so far. Enhancement through bloodstones failed. So we did knock them all out. Oh, we still have silence on Garnet. We forgot to remove that. Uh, so Carbuncle is actually going to come in handy here. Reflect is useful against this boss because all it does is cast offensive magic against us and reflect on itself. So Reflect will benefit us in two ways. It'll keep us safe from his attacks and it'll cause him to damage himself. And also, if he decides to cast Reflect on himself, VV can still be useful. Uh, because reflected spells don't bounce twice. So if you reflect yourself and then cast uh, black magic on your reflected party members, it'll still bounce back and hit him. So we get that echo screen going. Considering Osmos, but I don't think that's more useful to me than just spamming Blizzara. And the Reflect wears off really quickly, so that's a problem. So this will be kind of a, a tight, hectic fight. Uh, this party being pretty underleveled is also under static, uh, so HP values are pretty low. Damage output is not super high. We don't have Magic Hammer for Kina, which is unfortunate. We've been neglecting Kina and her uh, in their blue magic. Now he is Reflect on himself. Cannot Reflect an Eidolon spell though, so Judgment Bolt will stu still do the trick. Uh, the other thing, like prep-wise, I just kind of forgot about, I thought I, I equipped the Aqua Marine on Garnet so that uh, she would have access to summoning Leviathan. I guess I did not do that. Really thought that I had that locked and loaded and ready to go. Uh, Leviathan would have been pretty choice here. Because again, it's water-based magic damage. And damage that can't be reflected at that. The way we're going to keep spamming Ruby Light and trying to keep in mind that it doesn't last all that long. And this is unfortunate timing. Hey, that. Ooh, yeah, that's going to reflect back onto him. Ooh! That's a nice chunk of healing for the boss. Uh, we're going to bounce some spells off of the party onto him. And watch as he bounces his own spells onto himself. Because uh, the AI is not really smart enough to, if it has Reflect on to cast magic on itself to hit the party. Cool, great. And it's not the highest damage output, but we're just going to have to chip him down. That's just kind of how this is going to go. It's going to wind up that Dagger not only probably will wind up putting the most healing out of the whole party, she's also probably going to be the the biggest damage dealer we have. Uh, Gina, I'm probably only going to keep them spot healing because their, their physical attacks are not enormous damage, but it's still every little bit counts uh, when our output is this low. We don't have the big heavy hitters on this team. At least not without exploiting his weaknesses, which we can't really do that effectively uh, without Leviathan and water. In a pinch, though, White Wind will do the trick. We also have Ico for healing. We're not lacking for healing at all, but we also have to keep in mind, like, who we're healing and when, so we don't reflect more heals onto the boss. And honestly, with Ico, I would still prefer to just be spamming out Carbuncle. Reflect is so valuable on this fight. If we had some auto reflects, that would be great too. Ooh, 
really wish we had more random encounters just for the extra stats in the whole party, the extra levels, and obviously to teach VV water. Uh, so this boss has 22,000 HP, he has 10,000 uh, MP, and the reason I mentioned the MP is because if either of those numbers hit zero, you win. Uh, you win if you run them out of mana, you win if you run them out of health. It looks like if this, depending on when this command comes out, Vivi could die here. Yeah, you guys, command queued before mine. Alright, this is no problem. Uh, so even though Dagger is a little bit low on MP, we're just gonna have Kina go and do the spot healing while someone else throws an ether onto Dagger. She'll get Vivi up. Uh, and since Kina's command is queued up for right after Vivi comes up, son of a bitch! And of course, targeting Vivi down. I thought those would come out back to back, the white wind after the res. Alrighty. Well, this at least puts Dagger out of danger a little bit. Still gonna need to burn another turn resing Vivi again sort of import, uh, important to have him up. And you know, having like a sub-optimal party composition here, and a little bit of sub-optimal prep, going into this a little bit under-leveled, makes this a really fun fight, actually. You really have to play this one by ear. And it's a lot more than just like, you know, thoughtless auto-attacking. It's paying attention to kind of how healthy everyone is, who needs to be doing which uh, which healing roll at, a, at any given time, who exactly you're casting spells on to get around reflect, stuff like that. Makes it a little bit tighter. Which, honestly, throughout most of FF9 so far, we have not had to pay too terribly much attention during boss fights, or any fights at all. It's not a genuinely, like, difficult Final Fantasy game. So every now and then, when we get a spike like this, it's pretty welcome. It's the same reason why I love the Tantarian fight so much. So we're good and reflecting again. We hold on to VD's turn just for this. Oh, yeah. For a second I thought the Reflect didn't go through for some reason. And Vivi will bounce that spell off of the party, back onto the boss. Yeah, you can't really play, you know, tennis and volley the spells around from Reflect to Reflect. And a sped up version of the animation is always welcome. Looks like we're good. Hey, we beat it. Terminating defense systems. Yeah, it went a little bit longer than it could have. Made for a fun fight. It was touch and go there for a second with Vivi. <laughs> Just get, you get into those, like, those resurrection, the Phoenix down loops every now and then. That's why we need full life at some point here. A few of these party members we're probably going to have to concentrate on and just grind out a little bit before we get to the super boss, because if we are not adequately prepared for that fight, holy shit, it's going to be a shit show. It's going to be a complete nightmare. So all of the Desert Palace was going on, while uh, Zidane's party was just arriving back uh, on the, f the mm, the Forgotten Continent. No, sorry, not the Forgotten Continent. Damn it, the Outer Continent. Arriving back from the uh, Forgotten Continent, and they were out. Oh, now we get random encounters. They were out retrieving the Gulag Stone for Kuja. So they're not privy to the fact that Sid helped uh, the B-Team escape. 
Oh, that's more like it. <laughs> Return to the, the party that we've actually been kidding out. Immediately get a near 5k crit. Good stuff. And it's not a very far run back. Uh, to get back to Kuja. We don't have to do the whole desert palace. We just mm, teleport right to his chamber. Hmm, did we take a wrong turn? And Kuja waits just ahead, and he wants Zidane to come alone with the Gulag Stone. Still thinking that the rest of his friends are trapped in their cells. Hey, we're back to the good song. Yeah. And so what Kuja shows him here, we know to be some kind of trick or an illusion. We know they're fine. Unless something happened during that screen transition. Which... We find out pretty much immediately that... That... Is... Not the case. <laughs> <laughs> Took a little longer than I thought it would. So Zidane seems to have been lured into a trap. And now that the <laughs> the conga line of party members is just coming in after him. Except for Aiko. She needs to find another way in. Except she's now going to be confronted by Zorn and Thorn. That's going to do it for now. Thank you all for watching. Take it easy. Have a good one, everyone.